previously from the last lecture. Hello. Last time mom talked about the animal kingdom. And about what makes animals different from the other kingdoms. She also talked about invertebrates. How they do not have backbones. The lecture was so big, she had to split it into two. Now in this second part she will talk about vertebrates, like you and me, that have backbones. So, uh, let's get back to it. Bye for now. Section. Because what time is it? And now we're going on. We're doing okay. Depending. So now we're heading up into vertebrates. So we just did all the invertebrates. Didn't have a uh, didn't have a spine. Didn't have an internal skeleton. Now we're going to creatures with internal skeletons, like you, me, Monty, um, my cats, our dogs, stuff like that. So we kind of start, and there's there's major groups of this. So again, we came with an ancestor that started growing what's known as a chordate which is uh, like a proto-spine. And again, you'll notice things that are coming out of, again, so here's another group, unlike insects that kind of beat us to the punch, because um, they're the ones basically after plants first figured out, whoop, 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 got up, and that's why we had huge dragonflies and all this insane stuff, because now what we're looking at is we're looking at we went from a toxic place where the sun is a deadly laser and then the plants got up started surviving and they took all that carbon dioxide and everything like that and they changed the entire atmosphere of the whole planet thank you plants um and made it so there's more oxygen and on uh, the carbon dioxide so it was very oxygen rich because nobody was really using this oxygen the plants sure weren't they were just using the carbon dioxide um and so you know well the plants do work, actually use it in their mitochondria but not as much so it was really oxygen rich now so there was an atmosphere it was oxygen rich so the first creatures that basically, like I said, figured out where to go were um, our friends, the uh, scorpions, you know, the sea scorpions over time change, change, change to go up on too, which went from spiders, which went, in, you know, all, and then eventually split off into two different, we got the spiders going one way and the spiders actually went scorpion spiders and then the insects went their own way. And that's how they took over the earth before all those vertebrates got our act together or our spines together, really. So they didn't get our spines Hi there. together. Just hanging out with Hank, some of my I love you. We'll talk to you brother. later. Bye. So they got their, their act together before we did. Um, you know, those of us with spines. So we stayed in the ocean, or at least those of us with spines pretty much stayed in the oceans. So we had a chordate ancestor and it split off and we first group we're going to look at is the jawless fishes and there's two classes of these and um we're not going to go too crazy on them but basically sharks are jawless fish they have mostly uh they don't have true bones they have cartilaginous bones or cartilaginous bones which is like cartilage you know what makes up your uh, nose and your ears um so they don't have bone bones and we also started developing things like teeth, which is actually its own separate study of how teeth evolved through different species, too. So, because they're all insanely different. So then we went into cartilaginous fishes, like I said, so jawless fishes, uh, some cartilage, a notochord. We'll get into what a notochord is in a minute. And then we went to cartilagin cartilaginous fishes, which is basically sharks and I think hagfishes. And then you go into the modern bony fish. So this again, again, coming up out of here, cartilaginous placoderms. Those are those big ones with the crazy faces, uh, you know. Um, uh, and then again, splits and goes one way and the other way. And the fishes stayed. So these this bunch said, you know what? We're staying in the ocean. It's nice here. However, 
when this guy, right guy, you know, one of his cousins split or they decided to take two different routes, um, went into modern bony fishes and one group started developing something neat and cool. And that was lungs. And that's when these guys decided, you know what? The ocean is too cutthroat and there's a ton of oxygen up here and the sun is not a deadly laser anymore. Let's go. However, I've got to stay close to the land or close to the water because I don't have internal reproduction. And I also don't have a thick layer of skin. I have a very thin layer of skin that I breathe through. And so if I go too far, I dry out and die. So over time, they had to figure out those two things. How do we take the ocean with us onto the land? And that is the, the major question for us land-dwelling creatures. How did we take the ocean with us onto the land? To keep breathing and for reproduction. Because what are we? We are basically walking oceans onto ourselves. Even you, Monty, you are an ocean. A very skinny one. Great. What's an ocean? Why didn't you eat? He hasn't eaten his rat in the last two times I tried to feed him, you naughty boy. I just wasn't hungry. He's dead, so. Anyway, so basically it split. Basically, this is primitive amphibians. They're extinct. And modern amphibians came after them. Then we have primitive reptiles. Now, reptiles split in an interesting way. Primitive reptiles. Keep in mind, the reptiles we have today, like Monty, like alligators, everything that you've seen in a zoo or on TV that's, you know, living is not what they used to be millions of years ago. Okay. So we have primitive reptiles that basically figured out how to have thicker skin with scales to keep the water in so they don't dry out so they can go, they can go across the land without drying out. And the other one, eggs, because an egg is a little mini ocean so a baby can develop inside and then we just mammals and we'll get to us in a minute we did something we could did a cool trick where we basically turned ourselves into the eggs or at least one of our sexes so anyway so that primitive uh, reptiles uh, gave rise to what modern reptiles like monty are and also dinosaurs which then basically gave rise to birds so yeah, uh, the chicken nuggets you're eating, its descendants were raptors. I mean, velociraptors is one group. Dinichthys. Um, so yeah, you're, you're when you eat chicken nuggets in the shape of dinosaurs, it's kind of like the circle of life, but in a chicken nugget form. There is actually something to that. And then, yeah, they also split and yeah, mammals and you're probably going not no no and i can see where the pushback is it's like we didn't come from reptiles yes but australia and i'll get there in a minute so anyway so let's continue on so let's talk about the jawless fishes so this is the tunicates the lancelets the jawless fishes lampreys hagfishes and sharks they have a post uh anal tail in other words when they are embryos so we went from you know Egg sperm, poop, turn into a zygote, turn into a blastula, blastula inverts. Um, given enough time, everything, including us when we were embryos, had a post anal tail for a little bit. We reabsorb ours. A lot of creatures reabsorb theirs. Um, these guys don't, they keep them. So it's a notochord, which is a flexible rod used for support. This is the beginning of a backbone. It's not a true backbone like what we have. Okay. So it's just kind of like a cartilaginous flexible thing. It's a dorsal hollow nerve cord. So there are nerves running through it. It's flexible, protects the nerves. And they have not gills, but they have something called pharyngeal slits. And you'll see it right here on this lamprey. And you've just been introduced to the creature that Miss Royal does not like the most. And that's a lamprey. Look at that freaking thing. What they do is they latch on the fishes and just like drill into them. They also are an invasive species up in the Great Lakes, I believe. And they're chewing through some fishes we really don't want them to. Anyway. But see these holes? These aren't really true gills. They're pharyngeal slits. 
Now, this up here is a hagfish, which is funny. Have you ever bought a genuine eel, uh, what is it, eel hide uh, wallet? They're cheap as all get out. It's not eel. It's hagfish. And when hagfish get stressed, they just, like, explode in mucus. And... A, the mucus really detracts most creatures from even getting near it. And if you get a bunch of hagfish together, uh, where is it? Yeah, hagfish slime. There's some, yeah, look at that. Yeah, this was great. Um, Somehow there was an accident. She was carrying a bunch of hagfishes and they all got scared at the sink. Yeah. So. Yeah. So what happens if somebody tries to eat them, they just explode in all this slime, this mucus, and it actually uh, fills up their uh, jaws with goo and then you can't you choke on it. So. Yeah. Isn't it delicious? <laughs> so don't mess with hagfish, okay? Um, but we use them for real eel leather wallets. So win-win. So if you ever, ever have a, uh, if you look in a, a cheap wallet and you go, oh, it's real, real eel. It's not hagfish. Anyway, they have a cartilaginous internal uh, skeleton. And I could spend hours talking about sharks, too. I love sharks. Technically, these are two separate groups. Uh, the uh, jawless fishes and the sharks. They're actually two separate. They've been separated out since uh, a long time ago. So I'm, I need to update my notes. Because uh, I used to was taught them together. And now they've been split. So, again, classification is changing a lot of different things. So the lampreys and the hagfishes are... You know, in a different branch from off from sharks. Sharks are fascinating. Um, I mean, they're just insanely fascinating. And unfortunately, we're doing a wonderful job of murdering them all for something as stupid as shark fin soup. So this is going to, I'm going to get on my stupid soapbox, but heck, um, Gordon Ramsay backs me on this too. Shark fin soup is the dumbest thing on God's green earth because it's literally the, the fin, the shark fin is just a garnish. It's just a garnish. You don't eat it because shark meat's disgusting. I know. I've some people do eat shark, but ew. I've had to uh, dissect sharks before, back in you know my undergrad days. Formaldehyde plus shark meat equals evil. Um. So yeah, just nobody needs shark fin soup. It's just dumb. It's literally just garnish. I mean, honestly, just I'm fine with parsley. I don't need a shark fin sticking out of my soup. And it's just broth. It literally is just a broth. That's it. It's not made with shark. The shark fin literally, like I said, is just garnish. It blows my mind. It's like, oh, don't get it. It's stupid. And it also is killing off our sharks and our, we need our sharks because, you know, they help basically run the ecosystem. Fun thing, we used to think, you know, they're the top predator of the ocean. Yeah, no, that's uh, actually orca. <laughs> orca, and I'll get into them later, I like to eat killer whale. I mean, uh, uh, great whites. I killed, they are killer whales. What am I doing? Anyway, uh, whale sharks are fun um a lot of scuba divers can come up on them because they don't really have so much teeth as they have all this stuff the strain and that's literally what they do is they just strain out plankton and eat that all day but they're actually like the gentle giants of the shark family you can actually swim up to these guys and be like hey and they're like now keep in mind the sharks we have today are not the sharks of millions of years ago uh, again do not get them confused these are modern sharks no relation to the sharks that came from four. Yes, they have an ancient lineage, but that does not mean the ones we have today, those are modern sharks, are not the same, you know, back when dinosaurs were on the earth. So these guys, I mean, there's some interest, unless we find a megalodon, 
but I sincerely doubt it. But there's also some ancient ones we found. We found um, there's ones that live under the Antarctic ice um, and are so old that the one we found popped out and went back. Um, he was about as old as uh, he was born sometime during the Civil War. We dated him. They're totally blind. Um, like I said, they live under the pack ice. It slows their, it's, I mean, Antarctic, not Arctic. And um, it completely slows their metabolism down, but so they can live for years. And we don't even think we've seen the oldest. I think a newer one um, decided to go for a swim up in warmer weathers around Europe and was found. And they were like, oh my God, what are you doing all the way up here? And tried to date him. And he was like almost 100 years old. It possibly 200, I think. That was recent. I want to say that was like last year sometime I read that article. Um, So, fun. These guys are uh, very interesting. Um, They also have a very interesting nervous system. Um, We have something called the olfactory bulb. And ours is up in our nose next to our brain. And ours is about the size of a dime. It's this yellow patch of um, cells. That allows us to turn, you know, uh, what we smell into chemical signals that our brain can, you know, tell us and go, mm, that smells like roses or mm, that smells like chocolate. Or, mm, I love coffee or, oh, God, he farted or, oh, no, the freshmen have covered themselves in Axe body spray again, which is a thing. And um, these guys, they're all factory bulbs. Yeah, their brain's like that big and their olfactory bulbs are like huge. So they have a brain and then they have two very long nerve paths that go up to these huge olfactory bulbs in their nose. So their sense of smell, now keep in mind their sense of smell is quite different than ours, but they have an insanely acute sense of smell. That's why they usually go on that more than anything else. Their eyesight's not that great, but um, their sense of smell is outstanding. And it's interesting because, yeah, certain blood turns them on um, and certain blood they don't care about. Like if a human's bleeding and they're hungry, yeah, they might go up and bump and check out what's going on. But they're not going to go into a frenzy unlike, you know, with fish blood. If you get a bunch of nice chum, you know, with a whole bunch of fish parts and fish guts and fish blood and you'd pour it out and they go hog wild because that's what they're used to eating. Human is a little like, what is this? Is it edible? A bump? Yeah, maybe. And unfortunately, a lot of shark attacks come from not so much sharks attacking people just because they're hungry or anything like that. It's actually because um, we step on them. There's a lot of sharks that actually like to, especially nurse sharks, um, they, they live off our coast and they like to bury themselves under the sand. And we, being stupid idiots walk out into the water going oh, 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 and step on one and if somebody steps on you would you not get up and bite them i mean i'm just saying if somebody's just gunk, and then you're like ah i bite them too so a lot of shark attacks are just because a we're not supposed to be there and you know the ocean is their land not ours and see it's because it's usually one of the ones that's buried under the sand and somebody's just unfortunately got the misconception of standing on it now, we still get out of the water if a big boy comes up because we've, I mean, we've had some big boy attacks, uh, you know, but they're rare. They're very rare. The weirdest attack, shark attack we've ever had, and yes, I know I'm going off on 20 different tangents during this entire lecture, but hey, it's fun, is up in New Jersey where we had sharks actually come up into, uh, I believe, like I said, I want to double check, New Jersey shark acts in 1916 so yeah they just uh <laughs> yeah so this is crazy so the jersey shore attacks 1916 series of basically uh yeah it killed four people and one was injured and they came up the matawan creek it was just, it was 
and it was literally basically right here kind of basically where sharks starting to get a bad rap by humans going oh no sharks attack oh no sharks jaws didn't help either but anyway monty's stuck in my hair again but yeah um what happened is it occurred during a heat wave and the polio epidemic so yeah you think we're going through a lot with uh covid and you know all of our issues um at least we haven't had a shark attack yet knock on wood let's hope we don't <laughs> so yeah so this is where the man-eating shark started basically is these guys going up in again interesting 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 um i feel free to read more about it it's like i said i like bringing these things up because there's so many different things fun like i said i could talk about sharks for quite a while sharks are fun and interesting oh yeah if you want to learn more about sharks and actually go see some sharks go downtown to the aquarium have you guys been to the aquarium downtown I would highly suggest going because they actually do shark research and they actually have uh, sharks and how they actually grow them in bottles. Um, they actually take them out of their egg and put them in a bottle to develop. It's actually really interesting uh, research. Uh, the woman is extremely... Um, yeah, I know I'm doing this back and forth again. But I would... If you have not checked that place out, Let's see hunters uh hill, yeah hill uh aquarium yeah my team eco highly recommend going to this place it is awesome um the people there know their stuff um i love going there with my son they have enrichments and all sorts of different stuff um they're a lot of fun. They also go down to Florida a lot and do research down there, help with uh, uh, a lot of stuff down there. Uh, great stuff. Honestly, fun, fun, fun. Highly recommend. Definitely go check them out. They will teach you a ton about sharks and fish in general. They have, a, uh, I believe they have a, a couple of fish. That, what, what were they? They beat up on the sharks. They had to take them out of the shark tank because they were beating up on the sharks. <laughs> I was like, oh, really? They're like, yeah, we had to take those two out. Of, I'm like, did you used to have them in with the sharks? We're like, yeah, we had to take them out because they were beating up on the sharks. And I was just like, oh, my God. So yeah there you go sharks is our weird kind of like monty's stuck in my hair at the moment all right fish so speaking of fish that beat up on sharks here's the bony fishes these are modern bony fishes so anyway uh notochord may still may or may not still be there you sometimes you can see it sometimes you not depends on the species uh they have a bony skeleton now they have a gazillion bones compared to our 206 give or take uh yeah that's how many skeleton uh how many yeah, how many skeletons do you have how many bones a human normally has it about two, 206 i hope i didn't say 2000 earlier no i don't remember anyway um they have layers and layers and layers to their skeleton which is why you know fish bones um are a problem when you've cooked fish hopefully you've gotten all the fish bones out but it's hard and the reason is is because of depth they can actually their bones overlap a lot so they can crush with the pressure in the ocean and uncrush when they come back up because of their swim bladder they have a swim bladder that helps them um sink and float so depending on how much oxygen now what they're pushing um their gills actually have muscles around them so they can unlike sharks who some of them have to actually keep moving and some of them don't um it depends on the, the shark species like some of them can't stop moving uh, because that actually pushes uh, w uh, water across their, their gills and they can keep breathing that way because they don't have muscles there to push water past so they can keep breathing. Um, and that's actually why sharks can actually sleep and move at the same time because half their brain actually shuts down and sleeps and the other half keeps them moving and, the, uh, and then it flips. So isn't that cool? Uh, could you imagine doing that in class one night? You're just sitting there going, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not moving because like half my brain is asleep and the other half is awake. 
<laughs> but other sharks can they actually have started developing muscles around their gills so they can they can you know like the nurse sharks i was talking about they can bury themselves in the sand and hang out there and they can still breathe just fine so they don't have to keep moving fish same thing here so they they have gills not lungs again um they haven't Lungs are an interesting development. Um, there actually is a fish that has a very primitive lung, and they're aptly named lung fishes. They live in Africa, and when uh, the dry season comes and all the uh, rivers and uh, ponds and water you know, areas that you always see in the Serengeti with the lions coming up and sharing the water with the crocodiles and the elephants and nobody's killing each other because they all need the water, yeah, these guys, the lung fishes, what they'll do is they actually will make a, a mucus shell for themselves in mud so they don't dry out. And they actually breathe through their mouth because they have primitive lungs. So we do have fishes that actually have the beginnings of lungs and lung fishes are that. They're one of those those kind of things that show us, you know, basically where, hey, yeah, lungs can come from out of the fish family. Lung fishes show that. So another fish got a bright idea way, 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 way in the past of going, hey, you know, if I have lungs, I can probably go up on the surface and get away from these other fish that keep trying to eat me like these dang megalodons. Anyway, so, um, so again, their, uh, their uh, skeletons are collapsible for the pressure. So that's why they don't pop when they go up and down, unlike us. We pop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you want something not to look at, look up the Byford dolphin incident. It's B Y F O R D dolphin accident. Yeah, deep sea and us don't mix. Just saying. So, but we keep trying. Anyway, I live in water, have scales and fins, um, and they're cold blooded. And they lay tons of eggs, tons and tons and tons of eggs. And that's actually what, um, no brain, my brain's telling me something different now. I hate it when, you know, when you're like, you're trying to think about something and then it's like your brain keeps kicking out the wrong thing. Like I'm trying to think of um, fish eggs, which is a delicacy, which is caviar. Thank you. My brain, instead of caviar, kept kicking out um, escargot, which is snails. I'm like, no, dude, escar no go. I wanted caviar. Caviar is fish eggs. Yummy. Um, so anyway, and they do, they kick out a ton of eggs. What happens is the female usually kicks out a ton of eggs and the male comes over and fertilize and uh, lets go of the sperm, and that's how they fertilize. Again, they need water to fertilize their eggs. And then depends on the species. Some species just die, like salmon. You know, they they spend all that energy up and up and up and go, you know, up 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 the uh, up uh, back up the river, swimming against the current, jumping and jumping and jumping. We even have a uh, we've made little uh, thing like when we put a dam in, and it's a known uh, population uh, thoroughfare for salmon. We actually make salmon bridges, and it's cool because it's this one area that literally sucks the salmon up at the bottom of the um we have two ways of doing this there's ones where it, we make we make stairs on either end of the dam so they can jump up the stairs it's actually pretty cool but we have a newer way now which is with suction so there's at the bottom of the dam um what the do they 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 swim up into this this big tube that literally sucks them up shoots them through a tube and launches them back up at the top it's actually insane so they'll actually take these yeah they'll actually go Funk, and get launched do you imagine just you're a salmon you know you're expecting to jump up you know upstream and all of a sudden you go you get sucked up Funk, yeeted again that must be yeah this is wild so anyway so we figured out ways to you know even though we need dams in certain place for electricity and whatnot but <laughs> we figured out ways to help salmon usually it's salmon ladders that's what we call those steps we build in but the newer ones we put in are actually these suction things that makes them and yeets them up to the, to the next level they're kind of funny all right um was i done talking about fish 
Okay, moving on. Also, they can change sex. Um, Finding Nemo is a lie. I'm sorry. If you have kids near, cover their ears. Um, Because uh, what would happen normally is uh, when Nemo was born, Nemo would change to a female and become his dad's mate. Clownfish are like that. So, yeah, clownfish actually change sex. Uh, Fun fact. Um... Western Carolina University, when I was going there for my undergrad, um, they actually were doing um, studies on why fish can change sex, depending on if you can shock them at certain points of early life, like when they're still in the egg, but also right after they've hatched, you can shock them with either hot or cold uh, water, and it will change their sex. So there was groundbreaking studies being done at Western Carolina University this was 20 years ago wow anyway but um to show basically how you can actually change uh a fish's sex so yeah um fish can change a lot of different species of fish can change sex depending on the needs of the colony or the group crazy so anyway but there are distinct male and females there's no there probably are knowing these groups there probably is but anyway amphibians and reptiles also kind of maintain certain species not all this monty like monty he's a boy he's always going to be a boy um he's not going to change sex but there are lizards and we'll talk about that a little bit that can change sex and there are amphibians that can change sex too so sex is kind of a sliding scale in the fish amphibians and somewhat the reptiles anyway so amphibians these guys includes the frogs, salamanders, toads, and Sicilians. And honestly, this is great weather today for going out and going to find some salamanders. Our mountains are uh, one of the biggest areas of unique salamanders. We are actually like the second capital of salamanders in North America. The first capital of salamanders and studying salamanders is uh, the Northwest up in uh, Washington because it's really wet up in washington if you've ever been there i don't mean dc i meant the state on the west coast um but a lot of uh biologists that like to study uh salamanders come here because our mountains actually have the most one of the most diverse patches of just salamanders here so it's it's a big a lot of people make a pilgrimage here to study salamanders um so from uh, Washington universities, uh, Oregon universities. I've met a lot of uh, scientists coming this way from there to study salamanders. So no notochord, it's gone. It's been reabsorbed back into the body. Remember, notochord does not equal tail, two different things. Um, so the notochord gets reabsorbed. Um, they have smooth skin, moist, and they live in aquatic or moist habitats because they breathe through their skin. They have lungs, but they're not very good. Um, so they breathe through their skin. So their skin has to stay wet. This is why our lungs have to stay in our body so they can stay wet because being wet actually helps with, uh, gases going across the, uh, membranes diffusion remember diffusion over a short surface so that's why these guys have to stay wet so again they're kind of like uh our version of the non-vascular plants or the amphibians um the fact that they you know they have web feet they breathe with lungs and gills so they have both um some are one or the other some have both it just depends uh they're cold-blooded um they have moist smooth skin again it has to stay wet because they have to breathe through it. Uh, they have four legs, sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, the Sicilians are often mistaken for, no, for uh, reptiles or a snake, but they're actually not. I'll show you a Sicilian. They're fun. Look at the widow faces. See, you can kind of see why you look at this and go, oh my God, it's a snake. It's not. I am so much better looking than that thing. All right. That poor thing is not what it looks like when it's alive. <laughs> that looks terrible. That poor guy. This is what they look like. Five. 
they're not native around here, so you don't see them around here much. Back again. All right. So they're cold-blooded or exothermic, which is why they have to bury themselves in the winter uh, so they don't uh, die. Uh, they usually bury themselves in the mud on the uh, bottom of ponds and other things. There are some frogs that actually freeze solid, but they have a special um, uh, chemical in their blood that makes it so that when it freezes, it doesn't... Uh, uh, water gets... Well, you've seen it. Water expands. And water forms crystals. And those crystals... I'm sorry, my bangs are everywhere. And um, those crystals can uh, rupture cells, cell membranes very easily, which is why... You know, I had a student once ask me, why can't we reanimate, you know, people who are dead and frozen? It's because basically they got freezer burned. Um, you know, the ice crystals is uh, is um, basically broke up, you know, destroyed all the cells. So even if you thaw them out, there's all that cellular damage. They'll just, you know, bleed to death even if you could. So that's why, you know, Freezing people isn't a great idea, and that's why we're afraid. Unless you flash freeze them real quick and then keep them super cold, you're going to get the ice crystals forming, and that destroys the cells and all that fun stuff. Which is why, you know, um, currently with current technology, uh, cryogenics, you know, saving dead people cryogenically, kind of a farce. So, currently. Anyway, um, but there's frogs that, getting back to the point, there's frogs that actually have a certain chemical in them that actually prevents that from happening. So they freeze, but they don't die and they don't get cellular damage on a cellular level. So that way they uh, unfreeze in the spring and go about their business. And you actually find them in Alaska. It's kind of interesting. Um, so there's a lot of, again, interesting group. Um, but this is basically what we are seeing in the beginnings of okay we're leaving the ocean how do we carry the ocean with us but these guys didn't make it very far they figured out how to breathe above water um but they didn't figure out how to reproduce or breathe without water which is why they have to stay close to water or they didn't figure out you know how to reproduce without water which is like but what about toads toads you don't you know but that toads still have to go back to water to reproduce so that's why yeah you can see a toad in your garden he's hanging it out and you've picked up hopefully if you picked up toads i've picked up toads and you know they pee on you that's about it but they're dry they drive they feel dry but their skin is still very very thin because they're still using it to breathe across but they don't need to be as moist as say a frog but they still need to go back to uh, a body of water to have babies so these guys kind of are on the cusp of figuring it out but didn't make that next step and instead just said you know what we're good with this and that's where we get modern amphibians from the ancestors that were just like yeah we're good now so, reptiles. Here's where we figure finally life figures out how to maintain the ocean within itself and travel the land. So, no note accord gets reabsorbed. Um, dry skin with scales. Why? Keeps the moisture in, right, Monty? Actually, I should be letting you, but you're stuck in my hair. Because it is warm and dark so, in here. Speaking of reptiles and hair we're actually going to get into where hair came from hair is actually hair and feathers are just modified scales really you should check it out so anyway so monty you should talk about yourself here the uh, i am snack i am reptile i yep. am cold-blooded so my kind lays eggs i like eating dead snakes, mice lizards turtles alligators and dinosaurs sort of dinosaurs are an interesting offshoot they're not a reptile reptile they're an offshoot and then they offshoot again into what we know today as modern birds. So they're cold-blooded or exothermic, which means this, if you come by the lab at some point to say hi to Monty and me, um, you'll notice Monty has uh, heating pads and a heating lamp on his house because he needs external heat. That's why he also likes to give hugs 
because he also likes leeching on my heat. He's nice and warm right now because he's been around my neck this whole time. And I've been yapping. So um, scales is basically how they figured out, hey, we can't breathe through our skin. We'll dry out and turn into, you know, reptile jerky or amphibium jerky. If you've ever seen a dried out frog that got a far away from the water. Yeah, not so hot. Anyway, so these guys developed scales. And so the scales basically cover them and help them maintain their uh, water inside of their body. So it keeps the water in and the outside out. They also figured this out with eggs. So all reptiles use eggs. Now, some um, of them retain eggs inside their body and let them hatch entire inside their body and have live young. It's kind of a misnomer. They're not pregnant like we're pregnant. We call them gravid, which means uh, the females have eggs in them which could be fertilized or unfertilized. There are uh, a lot of creatures that actually will just lay eggs that are unfertilized. Um, happens in zoos a lot. There was a, uh, like Monty species, the uh, ball or royal python. Um, they were originally from Africa. Um, and uh, what happens is uh, there was a, uh, you know, probably a, cousin of Monty is a, a ball python herself. She was 62 years old and she decided just randomly to lay some eggs. She's at a zoo somewhere. Yeah. So I don't know. Monty's probably in his 20s. I've had him for about 17 years now. So and before that, he was at the zoo I used to work at. And before that, he was confiscated in a drug bust. Yeah, he's he's had a you know, he had a rap sheet. Everybody makes mistakes. We were all young once, right? Yeah. So anyway, they have ear holes instead of ears. Monty doesn't even have ears. Snakes can't hear. So you can scream and yell at them all you want, and snakes won't hear you, which is, yeah. Monty can't hear us. What? You'd be like, well, does he feel vibrations? Well, not like vibrations of the air. He does find feel vibrations like if you're walking up to him. That's why snakes get scared. And yes, actually, even the meanest looking snakes actually get scared. And um, they start, that's why they rattle their tails or anything like that. And the venomous snakes go, oh, because technically their uh, venom is like a gun with one bullet. For, uh, that's why snakes can give dry bites. Monty is a non-venomous, so he doesn't even have venom. But a lot of the venomous snakes, especially around here, sometimes they can give a dry bite and they have control over that. Uh, the reason being is because uh, uh, they don't want to use their one bullet because it takes about two hours from for them to replenish that uh, venom. So they're venomless, they're defenseless. Whereas, uh, you know, Monty can squeeze things and get out of things and climb away. Whereas uh, the venomous snakes, especially here in North America, are horrible climbers. They don't climb very well, not like constrictors do. So and that's why, you know, uh, you can see, you know, black snakes crawling up trees, you know, but uh, not so much everybody else, with the exception of the uh, cotton mouths. They're little snits. Anyway, um, Actually, they can be large snits. But long story short, that's why a lot of venomous snakes have the rattle tail because they're telling you, please, 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 please don't come near me. I don't want to use my venom. I really, really don't because then I'm defenseless for two hours. So they're trying to warn you just as much as other way. And a lot of the, actually, a lot of the venomous snakes, with the exception of the cottonmouths, uh, especially up in these mountains, will run. Um, I've walked up on uh, timber rattlers and they just tear out and because they're just like, nope, not playing around by. They're huge. I'm like, I ran, I, like I said, I walked up on one that was bigger than Monty, but he tore out because he just, he didn't want to take that chance. And I don't blame him. I didn't want to take that chance either. I kind of, you know, stood, stood silently out of his striking distance and watched him run away. So because it was like yeah bye i don't want to play with you either um so yeah there's a lot of so venomous snakes are way more afraid of you than they uh than uh 
although it's still good to have healthy fear of them. Don't, don't, no hugs. They don't want hugs. You don't want hugs. Nobody wants the hugs, except for Monty. Monty wants the hugs. Don't you, Monty? Yes. So anyway, um, again, this is where we get smell. Um, uh, oh, wait, I need to talk about their eggs. Okay, so eggs. So again, what are the two major problems we're talking about? Uh, not drying out. So you can live and breathe and go across the land without drying out and turning into a piece of jerky. Number two, reproduction. Well, how did they solve that? They developed eggs with thick walls to keep the liquid in, to keep that amniotic fluid in so that way their babies could develop. So eggs was the second uh, thing that uh, came about so that way they could traverse the land and not have to return to the water to reproduce. So we're finally getting into internal sex like even back here in the amphibians they're they're still having external sex they don't have internal sex the fr frogs actually help each other give each other the heimlich maneuver when uh basically what happens if a female allows the uh, male to come up what happens and she's impressed by him he basically comes up behind her and gives her a heimlich maneuver uh to help her get her eggs out of her body and as her eggs are coming out he releases a sperm and fertilizes it. so amphibians do not have internal sex but reptiles we finally figured out internal sex because again we're trying to conserve water we're not trying to lose our water um so that's why they have eggs now again they have live young uh which is a misnomer um a lot of the venomous snakes around here are live bearers which means they retain the eggs inside so what happens is um you know mommy and daddy have sex and um the eggs are up inside the gravid female if the female has eggs she's known as gravid and um the male will come up and fertilize her and but she'll keep the eggs up in her body and then they'll hatch inside of her she'll reabsorb the eggs and the babies come out so it looks like a live birth but it's not the same as in us mammals so so they have four legs or no legs and they were cold-blooded now, dinosaur, like I said, so dinosaurs split off this group. But what we have today split off this group. So modern reptiles are nothing like the reptiles of millions of years ago. Please understand this. So, you know, looking at Monty, he's just as modern as we humans are, um, relatively speaking. Um, so, so lost my train of thought woo woo bye <laughs> i was just about to jump into actually it's kind of interesting because uh the reason monty's uh species is called ball python is how they defend themselves if they get caught they'll actually curl up in a ball and then pray the bad guy <laughs> pray the the pray the thing that's bugging them goes away which is not the best but hey it's what they got but their other name is actually uh pythus regalis or the royal python which means um actually they got that name because these guys used to be kept as pets again they're originally from africa by uh, uh ancient egyptian royalty yeah yeah so no pun on my last name intended anyway so yeah i could start talking about reptiles now Here's where we get to get to mammals. Like I said, dinosaurs offshoot off of uh, primitive reptiles at some point, and that offshoot offshot again into birds. So where do birds come from? So birds are avies. They, basically, they are former dinosaurs. Um, and if you've ever seen a bird, watched a bird, check out their legs, check out how they move. The more we, I mean, for the longest time when we first started saying dinosaur bones, like my favorite, there's one, some guy, what is it? What is it? It's a special fossil. Bad fossils of dinosaurs. We had the longest time trying to put these guys together. Oh, yeah, here it is. <laughs> yeah we didn't always have the best understanding of when we discovered these bones of how these bones go together so it was kind of an interesting um crapshoot 
of trying to figure these guys out. So even books that I still have from when I was a kid show dinosaurs as these big hulking slow things that are always dragging their tails and stuff like that. And so, and when I was, you know, when Jurassic Park hit and things like that, um, we we started going, you know what? Their pelvis region looks more like that of a bird. Maybe they're more bird-like. And it's true. We've had a very long, long time to try and figure out, and like I said, in some cases, really badly, how dinosaurs work. Because we have their bones, and for the longest time, we weren't entirely sure how the bones go together. Look up the bone wars. It's actually how the U.S. Geological Survey started, and it's about uh, two... Um, to um geologists that hated each other's guts and would sabotage each other's work and digging up dinosaur bones out in Montana it's and New Jersey it's insane look it up the two of them hated each other until the day they died and they would just they would just screw each other over but that's how the U.S. Geological Service <laughs> So, yeah, there's nothing like a, a branch of the American government forming out of spite. So anyway, so I like I said, we we <laughs> I like I like how somebody put this. <laughs> so anyway, so this is known as the um, Magdeburg unicorn. And it was a fossilized skeleton of a woolly rhinoceros. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. But like I said, I mean, even back when, like, in the 80s, when I was a kid, this is how I used to see dinosaurs like this. They'd, like, you know, sit back on their tail. They weren't up like they are, or, or they like this. I mean, we've had some horrific, horrific <laughs> ideas of how dinosaurs were put together and, and what they look like and stuff like that. And then, we, like I said, again, we've got, like, ancient, I mean, well, not ancient, yeah. Well, you know, maybe ancient. Um, pictures of these guys, it's just crazy. Dinosaurs. I mean, I could just go on and on about these guys all day long. But anyway, because that was my thing. I, I originally, 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 when I was a little girl, I was like, I'm going to be a paleontologist. And I turned into a bi. <laughs> it's kind of dinosaur. Anyway. So like I said. So now. Uh, four limbs are adapted for flying, with the exception of penguins and emus and ostriches. Um, they still have them. It's just they've, you know, they've developed, a, you know, penguins, they've developed those forearms into swimming. Emus and um, ostriches just decided, you know what, it's better to go running and kicking. And they can. Um, uh, an ostrich can uh, kick with the force of one kick destroy completely obliterate a lion skull that's just how much force they generate so don't go messing with the ostriches now this is wacky so apparently you can actually race ostriches they actually have ostrich races where they put basically kids yeah I know on the backs of ostriches race them. <laughs> but you can't race zebras zebras refuse to be uh, uh, domesticated yeah isn't that weird? Anyway, have feathers, which if you look under a microscope and then you look at a reptile skull under a microscope, you'll actually see that. I wonder if I can pull that up. Let's see here. Reptile scale versus under a microscope, if you pull it up, I'm not seeing it. They look very, very, very similar. Oh, so yeah, basically what we're looking at here is that, yeah, we believe the feathers and or even our own hair uh, came up through uh, uh, primordial reptiles. And that's actually why we have hair. Then I need a haircut. And birds have feathers because they're really just modified scales. They kind of have the same origins. And you can see the change over the fossil evidence. It's actually really interesting and really impressive. Um, 
now these guys are where we hit warm blooded. So they've we've turned from warm blooded. They have a three chambered heart, which unfortunately misfires on occasion. So birds will die of a heart attack randomly in the. So yeah, um, not great, but it works, kind of. And we believe they evolved from a subset of dinosaurs because of fossil evidence we found. We found um, uh, fossils that actually had feathers on them, or at least very, very primitive types of feathers, modified scales, you'd say. Um, so they're warm-blooded, so they maintain an internal temperature that's different from the outside. Um, they have ear holes instead of ears. Owls, e owl ear holes are insane. Like one, and it's so they can get a, a better uh, range of sound picking up. They also are insanely intelligent. Uh, like, for instance, the corvid family is one of the smartest of the bird families, and that includes ravens and crows, which is why do not get on the bad side of a raven or a crow. They remember. Um, it's actually been shown many, 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 many times that um, if you treat crows kindly, they remember, and some of them will bring you gifts. Um, the other end is the parrot group. Parrot group are insanely smart. Um, the smartest being the uh, African gray. It also has the largest vocabulary. Um, they actually uh, do kind of somewhat. We've we've actually found some understanding in the fact when you know they parrot us. Um, some of them don't. Um, some of them just trying to imitate. So it sounds like we used to have several uh, different types of parrots at the zoo I worked at. And two of them, when they'd start talking, it sounded like um, a phone conversation from like a couple doors, a couple rooms over. Like you could, and you're standing right in front of them and they're talking away at each other, but it sounds like muffled discussion between two people in the kitchen and you're upstairs. It sounds exactly like that. It's like they, they kind of hear us, but they don't, you know, there's there's no meaning, so they're just mimicking us. It's actually quite interesting. But African greys, oh boy, they're thinking. I had one pull my shirt off one time. I was bent over cleaning his cage, and he decided to grab the back of my shirt and just yoinked it over my head. <laughs> such a snot, Charlie. He was such a snot. Anyway, um, so they're actually in, very intelligent, very funny, very long-lived. A lot of people don't realize if they buy a parrot how long lived these creatures are. Um, and unfortunately, uh, zoos get dumped with a lot of very uh, geriatric birds that have, um, they also will start nervous plucking. It's kind of sad and pluck themselves bald. Um, and that's because if they get anxiety and they do, they'll start doing that to themselves. It's it's pretty sad. So, um, and they usually kind of imprint on like one owner and they get very grumpy if they're not with their person. So it's kind of interesting. Um, it was funny. I was driving into work today and uh, there was a, uh, a, a turkey walking around in the parking lot just going, what's going on? And I was just like, oh, hi, turkey. And like I said, watch, watch a bird if you ever get to see a whole bunch of turkeys wandering around because they're out and about right now. And... Um, any other birds just watch them they're very the more we've been learning about dinosaurs the more we've been going these are the birds are the descendants of dinosaurs actually we've also started turning on old genes and um, getting more and more dinosaur traits and birds um, there was a guy in china who was doing a, a, a testing on a gene expression and he was turning on older and older genes that are technically usually turned off um, and he was getting more and more um, dinosaur looking traits out of the chick out of the chickens he was working with. It was really interesting. Um, I think you can look up that work. Um, it was interesting. So yeah, um, we've got pretty immutable evidence that pretty much birds came out of their they're they're the survivors of the masses of the extinction that killed off the dinosaurs they are the survivors we are the champions of the dinosaurs extinction anyway um so unfortunately now we're going through another so there's actually like five mass extinctions throughout the uh history of life on earth and we'll actually talk about that in a couple weeks um but uh 
birds unfortunately we're going through a sixth extinction right now and unfortunately it's the birds we're unfortunately changing the habitat and killing off a lot of the bird species on this planet so unfortunately the let's hopefully birds will survive us which sucks because we like birds All right. Dun, 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 dun. Mammals. So, mammals. Again, we have modified scales. We have here. Oh, we're warm blooded or endothermic. Um, some of us have fur, like my cats, because they're soft and fuzzy. Um, now, there are still mammals that lay eggs. Uh, primitive mammals are called marsupials. And. Um, if you ever, and thank God for Australia. This is why I mentioned Australia earlier. Australia is kind of our um, island of creatures that didn't survive uh, in the rest of the world. Because there's quite a jump. You know, I look at Monty and I don't go, wow, look, I can clearly see where we came from in our ancestry. <laughs> you know, nothing alike, nothing alike at all. Right, Monty? Yeah, we're nothing alike. But um, so we were missing this jump between, you know, um, primordial reptiles that split and again went into modern reptiles and then split and then went modern reptiles, dinosaurs, and then dinosaurs, birds. Um, we split back then too. Mammals split off way back when. And um, we didn't have this in between. We we're like, oh, well, how do you get from ancient reptiles to us i mean we don't look like reptiles i mean there's people that believe that reptile people rule the world and illuminati and stuff like that but you know we don't look like reptiles so australia is kind of that time capsule that um, exists where marsupials survived and flourished where in the rest of the world the only marsupial that is found in the rest of the world is um hold on possums I had a student who was obsessed with possums. Anyway, so possums are the only uh, marsupial that was successful enough to survive outside of Australia. So we were missing that that leap, that jump, that that link species. Uh, so but then we went to Australia and said, wow, these duck-billed platypus and echidnas are like half mammal, half reptile. And it's true. They actually have venom. Um, they have scaly parts. Um, especially echidnas and duck-billed platypi. I mean, they literally kind of look like somebody smooshed a reptile and a mammal together and made this weird thing. And they are what's left of the transition species. Um, again, they're modern versions of the transition species from ye millions of years ago. So, you know, I'm not saying it's like that. I'm just saying, you know. So what happens is, and you can see this through marsupials, uh, duck-billed platypi and echidnas still lay eggs. So we have mammals that still lay eggs. But then there's this jump. It's like, well, how did we go from an egg to a womb? And there's a long process involved with that, that we're trying to drop the egg, but keep, again, the ocean inside of us to bear our young. So marsupials started slowly turning from... Uh, eggs but retaining the egg kind of inside of them not like how the modern reptiles do it today with the live bears but they'd have a pouch which is where we get all the pouched marsupials so like kangaroos and koalas and what happens is they give birth the fetus literally comes out crawls up the mother and then goes into the pouch to finish developing and growing until it's ready to come back out again so that was a step so there's a step but yeah literally what happens is um yeah kangaroo birth is interesting so they literally give birth to this itty bitty like tiny little fetus looking thing and the mother licks a trail of her fur down to her uh, pouch for this little tiny fetus to literally climb up her leg out her vagina up her leg and into the pouch where it latches on and finishes its uh 
uh, gestation there until it turns into a joey and even then a joey jumps in and out of the pouch still for protection with mommy isn't that insane and koalas are the same um so there's a lot of the creatures with the pouches and australia is a place where they survived the test of time where mammals were way more successful than marsupials were um in the rest of the world with the exception of our friend the possum so then we figured out okay because and this is where your immune system comes into play see what, what was happening was the fact that we developed an immune system even monty has an immune system if you try to grow another life form with different dna inside of you your immune system will get triggered and it will sit there and go attack it it's it's in our body it's going to kill us so we've got to attack it and destroy it attack it and destroy it well that's the thing um <laughs> that's the thing guys we've we've got to make sure you know if we want to raise our children inside of our bodies or at least get it going inside of our bodies to begin with and then bring it on the outside when it's big enough or ready um you know we need a barrier between our immune system and this new life and that's where the placenta and the womb came from it was our answer to the pouch Basically, again, we're trying to keep mom and baby separated so mom's immune system doesn't destroy the baby, which actually still happens in some people. Some people's immune systems are so insane that it actually kills the baby. But that's why we have a placenta. It's to keep that barrier between mom's immune system and baby's immune system. And that's where it actually, so that way, uh, blood uh, flow and uh, so, uh, you know, food coming in from mother, it goes across that placental barrier, which keeps the immune systems mostly apart. And I mean mostly, um, but allows nutrients and oxygen to flow through to the baby so the baby can, can continue growing in the womb. So we had to have that barrier to keep our immune systems apart. Pretty crazy, huh? So, and that's why we give birth to live young. Um, we uh, nurse our young with milk, and that's true across all mammals. We have lungs, and we need air to breathe. Uh, mammals that live on the land have four legs, and we have ears that stick out. Our ears are different depending on everything, and we're warm-blooded. Again, we maintain an internal temperature, whether it's cold or warm outside. So, and we have to raise our young and all that fun stuff. And like, you know, Monty, who the mom just gives birth and then she sits on the other end of the tank and the kids hatch and then they stay in their eggs, stick their egg out and go, oh, I think I'll stay back in. You know, unlike us, which, you know. And we have a long development time on our babies because we have giant brains. It's actually, unfortunately, the concession we had to make is we had to make very, 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 compared to other young in the mammal world, we have very, very weak babies. You know, I mean, heck, giraffes, when they're born out of their mom, they have to survive like a, you know, a meter drop. And then get up and be able to, you know, get on their legs and move with mom before a lion comes up and eats them or hyenas. Actually, hyenas are strangely the more successful out of the group. I'd worry more about hyenas than lions. And hyenas and lions hate each other. Oh god, that is such a it's like if you want if you want gang wars that makes our gang wars look like nothing, lions and hyenas. They will go out of their way to kill each other. Literally will go out of their way to kill each other. For no reason whatsoever. I mean, I, I guess you could say they're getting rid of the competition, but at the same time, they're just whew. so anyway so there you go god knows oh god it's five o'clock anyway all right so there you go us mammal, 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 mammal. next time someone asks no. you who you think you are is that it yep that's it okay so um i'll get rocking on editing this tonight and hopefully by tomorrow which is thursday i should have both the plant lecture up and this lecture i may have to split this lecture I may not. I don't know. We'll see. Because this kind of went a little long. But then again, I have so many stories about this group. It's insane. So anyway, after this, we're going to move into ecology. Yes. 
basically how all this stuff that we've been talking about last semester and this semester start fitting together in a bigger picture. Uh, that's basically what ecology is going to be. So with that said, um, I'm going to leave you here and um, see what I can get put up in uh, the Moodle for uh, my courses for us. And um, I guess I'll see you next week, hopefully. Well, yeah. So I hope you guys are doing well and I'll see you guys next week. So bye.